to tell students to do when they come to my office is sort of a skill set exercise. It's basically taking a piece of paper and folding it in half, and on your left hand side, or on the right hand side, is like jotting down the key skills that you think employers are looking for. So you guys have come to enough of these sessions, you've heard, you've know, gone to panels, but you've heard employers talk about what they're looking for, and sometimes people just kind of throw out things that employers want to see. You know, it's just like, what's like the key thing employers like to see in general? We want employers. In terms of skills, what skills do you, are you all learning right now? Writing, right? Yeah, just like analytical skills and like research. Right. Writing. <laughs> yeah, so that's going to go on your list of the key skills that you're going to think about. What else? Communication. How about that? Right? Like how your written and oral communication is. How about how detail oriented you are? Right? Um, and, and those types of things. Passion. You're going to add things like passion and commitment. Right? Because you're a public interest government person. That's going to go on your skills list. You know, your drive, your passion, your experience, maybe your volunteer work, community service work. So those are the kinds of things that are going to be a little bit different than people who are being private sector. So that's going to go on your list. And then you're going to take your job and you're going to connect it to that. Okay, so how many, has anyone here been a teacher or something that? Oh, great. Okay, so I've had teaching experience in the, in the past, but not. That's fine. So tell me the things that you did as a teacher. Um, <laughs> well, you, yeah, you have to be good at communicating. Okay, right. Communicating.
bunch of different versions of it. So not only does your private sector resume look different, but also for different public interest and government employers. Okay, so that's gonna look a little bit different as well. So definitely keep that in mind. Okay, so how do you basically tailor the resume? Like where do you start? You know, when you start thinking like, oh my god, what do I do? How does this work? Um, sometimes it's really good to take a look at what employers are sort of looking at um, and what their websites kind of look like. I'll give you an example. Oops. love to go work at the Legal Aid Society. They like to spend their summers there, do externships there. And I kind of wanted to just give you an idea of how best to peruse their website. Because there's so much information. I feel kind of sorry for private sector people because their, rest their, their websites are geared to well, private sector employer websites are so geared to the client that it's really hard when you're a law student to kind of peruse it. But public interest ones, they're not like that at all. So it's telling you putting justice to work. That's their tagline. And they're telling you the six different categories that they're working for. The other thing that's awesome about this website is look at, they have a blog. The blog is telling you <coughs> different things that are issue points for them. They're, they have a news section. They have a press release section. And all of these are sort of telling you what's happening. Fishermen file a lawsuit alleging slavery in Hawaii. That's pretty amazing. Like, what, what kind of a big news topic? So it gives you kind of a sense of what's happening in this world, right? So when you sit down and you're looking at your resume, you're updating your resume, you're sort of keeping that in mind. Like, okay, what are kind of issue areas in this world that I'm interested in? And the other thing that's really great and makes your life a lot easier is to, kind of, is to connect to the mission. What do we do? What's our mission? We advance justice and economic opportunities for low-income people and their families that work in school and in the community. So knowing mission statements, getting a sense of what their press releases look like, what their information looks like, it just starts to give you a sense of what people are looking for. So when you sit down and start drafting, you'll have that in mind. And how many of you are planning to apply to jobs through the public interest public sector today? I want to see everybody raise their hand. Okay, great. Um, so the nice thing about that is you're going to, in December, like you're going to be in the middle of finals, don't worry about it when you're in finals, but you're going to get a list of all these employers. You're going to go straight to their website and you can Google them and look and see what they're doing and, and start to remember, always look at the mission statement. Because if you address your resume and cover letter to the mission statement, that is like gold, okay? So just wanted to show you that so you guys would get a sense of what some of that looks like. I had students come in during the third year, they cram all the stuff into one page, and they're like, why did I 
and you're like, hey, TV, now it's TV two pages. And not like a page and two lines on the second page, right? Just try to, try to you know, make it just nice and balanced. Um, yeah? By saying that it can be two pages, is that a recommendation to make it two pages? Good question. I'm so glad you asked that. So it depends. Now, many of you are starting out in your career. You don't have a ton of experience. And <coughs> Some of you have tons of experience, and volunteer experience, and you have like an excellent amount of stuff. It's an art in sort of narrowing down what's key for that group of employers you're applying to, right? So you're gonna maybe you volunteer from everything from, um, you know, a homeless shelter to baby dolphins, but maybe you're really aiming for like a marine biology type of, you know, animal rights group. So maybe you're gonna emphasize more of what's happening in the baby dolphins world. And maybe not, not that that's not relevant, but it's, if you have so much experience, then it's about tracking it down a little bit. But no, it's not a recommendation. But we do see employers who are like, oh, well, we're going to have all this stuff, but you know, they just didn't have enough room to write about it. But good question. Any other questions at this point? Yes? How far back is too far back of stepping back? Good question. I think it depends. If you're coming out of undergrad, I would say probably, you know, you can go all the way back to high school if something in high school happened that's really relevant in terms of your public service. If you're a second, third career person, um, it's really about picking and choosing, maybe going back, you know, five to maybe six years around that range. But that's probably how far I would aim for. But, it, you know, come in and talk to us because sometimes there's things really far back that may be relevant for right now. And that's okay too, but it's also just how you put it in. Any other thoughts on other hand? Um, so once again, it's not everything you've ever done. Like try to focus it, right? So keep, keep that in mind. Um, and you know, another thing to think about is within that text that you're writing. If you started answering the phone at a at a place and then you were running it, your manager, don't start with started, you know, answer phones and correspondence. Like start with the management piece of it. Okay, so also think about also reverse chronological in terms of the content. Yes. As far as not including everything, does that make it look like you have gaps? Or how do you account for that with dates if you're leaving stuff out? Yeah, so sometimes you can actually just put in the employer name, your title and a date. And you don't even have to put in content. So if you're worried about gaps. Okay. So that it just shows consistency. Okay. But also, you know, if you have job people, like some of my students have worked all the way through school. And, you know, they want to show that. They're like, okay, you know, I, I did this, I did, you know, I did all these different jobs. And that's, those are usually the times where I'm like, just put the title and the date. And, mm -hmm. and people will kind of understand, like, what a barista does in Starbucks. You don't have to go into that level of detail, unless maybe you had a management position or a sales position or something outside of what people normally think. Ah. 
up. It's large enough, good font, that it just pops out. Then you've got your address. Your, you know, usually start with your address, then the phone number, then the email, um, in that order, or sometimes email and phone number are reversed. But uh, I wanted you to kind of see that. Then you've got your education section. And in your education section, you've got the academics, the honors, the distinctions, that kind of stuff. Um, and usually, while you're in school, you're going to have the education section up front. But after you graduate, you've got a year to your belt, you're going to move it to the bottom. Okay, so that's something you keep in mind. Um, with the experience, often you want to avoid categorizing this experience in times of professional or legal at this stage. It's just fine to start with experience, unless you know, you've got some other type of experience or you know, something else, and you've had a different profession at that point. You kind of want to make that distinction. And we talk about what title fits best for you when you come to and meet with us. Also, community involvement, volunteer work, having those kinds of sections are great ways to kind of make a distinction between the things you really want to highlight to the employer, especially you know, if you have um, stuff that's very relevant to what they might be doing. Honors and awards <coughs> inside of school, you can have a separate section. If you've gotten these awards and honors while you're in school, it's best to just keep it in the end. Also, languages and interests are a really great thing to have in legal resume because when you're just kind of awkward, you know, as interviewers, and sometimes it just breaks the ice. Especially for those of you who are, you know, have a different language, it's so important for a lot of public interest and government employers. So there might need to do one-on-one -on -one client communication and using those language skills. So having that like front and center is great, and we'll talk about how to make those. We don't have objective sections in the lower Okay, I just wanted to add on that question. Um, for languages mm -hmm. and interests, mm -hmm. I see here that the languages, or I don't see any languages listed, but could you have like a separate subsection of languages, or should that be It should be together, usually. Okay. Yeah, just because you want to save a little bit on space. Okay. And I'll show you an example in the slides of a couple of languages. Any questions? So I have a question of how the, um, I guess like the student group affiliations and things like that are listed. Mm -hmm. um, what if you have like, I guess like a student group affiliation that you like, feel like, like the work you did in that is like really important towards either demonstrating interest or comparable skills? Yeah. And like, would you, I guess if you're using this format, would you end up listing it twice, like first under education and then later on, like where you actually get the full yeah, of what you did? Yeah, or? so I'm glad you brought that up. Because I have a lot of um, students that have been part of the Greek system as undergrads, and they did really had really significant roles while undergraduates. And I think it's really great to have a section of leadership skills or leadership experience. Excuse me, not skills, leadership experience, and putting in, like you know, president, I Omega, whatever, and then going into the details of what you did to show that leadership role if it was something that's really significant. Especially, it's really great to have that section if maybe you don't have. The that makes sense. So it's sort of so, weighing the relevant experience. So in that case, would you not list it under your education? You would put it there under your education, probably as like president, that. Uh -huh. And then you'd probably do another like leadership experience piece where you list it at the end, but then okay. went into a description. Is that okay question? Yeah. Any questions so far? I'm going to show you some more, more detailed examples. Okay, so once again, like the sort of different ways you can write your header. So remember, all I want you to see is the consistency of where things lay out. It's usually like your name, your address, phone number, and email. One thing to think about is when it comes to your phone number, set up your voicemail with your own voice, right? Employers want to hear that they're calling the right person. Sometimes people, it's just a beep. Sometimes it's like, you've reached this number, but is this number correct? I actually called someone who left me a voicemail yesterday. I called the person back, and it was just a beep, and I left a phone message, and then I got a call back from the person it was not, who said, I left a really long detailed message, and I'm not that person. <laughs> but the person said their email, their, their phone number so quickly on my voicemail that I ended up dialing the wrong number. So it's just something to know. You don't want to miss an important call from an employer, so just make sure your voice is on there. What about okay. LinkedIn yeah. URLs? Is that a good thing? Yeah, LinkedIn is great. If you have a LinkedIn profile, put a 
photo in. I love to see, like, put a photo in, like, put aspects of your resume as you're updating it. Put that oh, no, I mean in the top the top portion, like, along with your email. Like, would you also recommend putting yeah, it in? Yeah, you could probably, yeah, you probably wouldn't be able to fit it there, but you could probably use a different format to fit. You could use, like, the, the Jessica Wood or the bottom two and probably fit your LinkedIn URL. Yeah, in there. And also, use an email that you check often. It doesn't have to be, you know, a Haven email account. But also just be careful that the email is really easy to type in and, and not too controversial. You don't have like, you know, hot lawyers or like Chanel or something like that. Just <laughs> keep <laughs> you know, like your name. Like, it's really, really simple. Oh my God. Um, so some of you might want to go work in LA and you have parents there. Um, what's your parents you know, address? Don't feel like, oh, I need to put my Haven email all the time. That's fine. If you're targeting like, Employers in a different area, go ahead and do that. It's perfectly fine. We do that all the time. We get questions about that all the time. Okay, so I usually get a lot of um, uh, questions on the education section. So we are tasting college of the law, not school of the law. So definitely keep that in mind because tasting alums love to call us and tell us, I can't believe this, but your students are writing school of law. So tasting college of the law, comma, um, after University of California. And you can write at University of California, you can write at UC Hastings. If you're going to write at UC Hastings, no dots, just UC. That's what I need to keep in mind. We uh, confer Juris Doctor degree program, not Doctorate. When I graduated from law school, I got a Juris Doctorate, so that's what I have. It's here, here, Juris Doctor. Oh, wow. um, what's the difference? You know, it's just one of those old school formalities. It's, it's not that it's a less degree, it's just that my law school probably should have. <laughs> but this is a modern thing. So all law schools these days use doctor. They should. Yeah. Jurist doctorate. Well, my school is doctorate. It just it's also one of the old tools. But okay. So journals. Journals are always underlined by talent or a top five. Uh, you're not gonna have to worry about this one next year, but I just wanted to put that out there so you know. A lot of times people will put their clinics in, you know, in their education section. I like to see it in their experience section. And you want to write UC Hastings, comma, the clinic so that people kind of know. I see it so many different ways and you'll see a sample of how it's written. That's also something you have to work on. Also notice there's no GPA on here and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and also list the activities you're engaged in while you're everything, the kitchen thing, just remember things you're actually engaged in. Because if someone asks you about, oh, so, you know, you're a member of this organization, uh, undergrad, like, you know, and you're like, oh, yeah, you just, just stop there and thinking about what you did. So just, just put stuff you're actually engaged in. Um, magna cum laude, summa cum laude, <coughs> always lowercase, always italicized. That's something that people um, have different distinctions for. Uh, thesis as well, you can quote it or underline it. Okay? We just want to get you to that right now. Does any, do you have any questions on this question so far? Yes? If you're going to do UC Hastings, would you uh -huh. still put the comma before Hastings? Yeah, no, no, no. Then you would just be UC Hastings. Yeah. Any questions? Yes? Would you list scholarships under education or separately? I will probably list it under education. Unless you have like extensive staff or things that happen outside of the school environment, then you probably would have a separate section. Would it be inappropriate to just say University of California, comma Hastings, assuming it's say I don't know, it's like Bay Area, you assume that all no, the first year knows that Hastings is law school. That's totally fine. Yeah. For activities like <laughs> or or ADR, that goes under the education. That's under education. Yeah. But then some way you might. Have very, you know, might go do competitions and things like that, or so you're still going to put that in your education. I just want to get you to give a little bit of an example. Okay, so here's some experiences. And I kind of wanted to, you guys to take a look at the difference between a legal and a non legal job. So if you look at the assistant chef position, <laughs> like, you know, once again, we talked about earlier when I was asking about your teaching experience. Notice how the writing communication skills are highlighted. You know, the person is, you know, writing blogs, they're doing menus, they're educating staff. Um, it's just showing that they have initiative, that they're self 
Kickstarter, so again, writing skills potentially, um, you know, creating menu items with 500 appetizers. Well, that shows you can work under pressure and you help to organize, right? So those are the kind of skills that are coming out of that. And then I have the judicial externship listed as well because many of you are probably going to apply for externships potentially, or your colleagues are. And um, you always start with the judge's name first, then the court. So it usually ends up being. Um, Oh, the, the slide says reverse chronological, I think, versus, I don't know. Oh, yeah, the function. No, no, it's either or, whichever one you feel more comfortable with. Okay. So, so it might be more acceptable to place certain, it might be more acceptable to place certain things first if you feel like they're more relevant to the job that you're applying for. Well, you don't want to start switching up dates and things like that. You want it to definitely start with the most current thing down, but you can, like, omit things, right? You don't have to necessarily put, you know, the job in between or the volunteer work in between, or you can put things in a volunteer section so that some things are more succinct. And it's also depending on the cover letter, too, what you talk about. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but this is just an example of, of the volunteer and community experience. It can look very much like what you have in the experience section, but it can even be like just listing it. You can literally read out all the text and just write to what you did. That's enough, too. I just wanted to kind of show you different things and how 
first decimal, second decimal, third decimal. We don't use the okay, so that's we don't cut it off. We don't um, uh, go up in a number or down in a number. We don't do that. And we don't like put the whole number all three digits. With your GPA, it comes in three digits. And okay, you don't round up or round down. Okay, any questions on that? So just keep that in mind that they don't usually like to see it. A lot of you are going to be assigned to um, jobs for the kids yesterday. 99. responsibilities included. A nice trick is to print out your resume and take a look at it before you actually submit. It's a really good editing tool. Also, always email a PDF, not a Word document. Many of us edit our resume multiple times. For some odd reason, law firm employers, recruiters are always telling us that they can see your time changes. But that's not how they do it. I haven't figured it out, but apparently they know how to do it. Say more with less work. Really get into the exercise of being really succinct with what you're writing. It will make your life a lot easier. Not to be super wordy, keep your sentence short and to the point can say a lot more. Um, another, like the sans serif font, fonts are pretty popular. So Calibri, Arial, Times, those are kind of the more standard legal fonts in the legal industry, so I would say stick to that. Don't go crazy with bullets. Sometimes I see an entire resume that has bullets. Pick a section. Not everything has to be bullets. You can indent and, um, you know, that's something you can stop as well. All right, so can I get a volunteer to read the resume for me and a volunteer to read the cover letter for me because I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about introducing this concept a little bit. Can I get some? Yes? Thank you. Uh, resume, California Rural Legal Assistance. Modesto, legal intern May 2015 to August, interviewed clients, educated clients on housing and or employment rights, prepared pro per legal documents, researched post-judgment remedies, housing law and employment law, drafted motions to vacate and enter new judgments, and for new trial. Uh, cover letter. As an intern at California Rural Legal Assistance last summer, I worked on employment law and housing discrimination cases. My primary assignment this summer involved interviewing clients and reviewing documents to prepare discovery responses for 16 plaintiffs in a complex multiple party lawsuit involving housing, retaliation, and wage and hour claims. I regularly interact with the client, relieve the, their concerns, and help them feel confident in their ability to relay pertinent information for their case. My interaction with clients has enhanced my communication skills as well as my ability to empathize with and reassure others. What's happening with the cover letter? What is that like? 
you started out from the arts now, how much your writing has changed, right? And how much you look at things differently, you look at cases differently, you look at facts differently. It's kind of this evolution that change is happening in your brain. That's really fantastic. And you can use the same skills in this process. Okay, so I just wanted you guys to see that. Okay. And so now I'm just going to give you sort of the, the bare bones. So that first paragraph is, is really key, super important, and especially for public interest government people. Because it's your introductory paragraph. It's like who you are, what's your law student. And it's also, what am I applying for? A summer job, or is it uh, maybe an externship, or is it a postgraduate position? You have to sort of identify right away. And then I always love students to craft their hook sentence. As someone who had a family member go to prison and went through the process of helping them find legal help, I'm interested in working in prison right now. You know, like that's your hook sentence. And that is what's going to catch someone's attention right away so they keep reading. Okay, so develop that hook sentence. What is it about this employer that I'm going for? And now a lot of times what's going to happen is they're going to sit down and they're going to be trying to get a guest face. Thank you. 
how they're going to make my life easier. And that's all I want to hear. That's all I want to see. Like, how can you make my life easier? And they're interested in what I do. Oh, they, they're telling me stuff in the interview that they read. Or, so so that's, that's who you want to be. That's what he thinks is. And that's what we want to teach. And that's what's going to help you to get the essay and knock it out of the park. Is really, and I think that's a discussion to all of you and why we do so well. So any questions on prevalence so far? Yes. Uh, for when we print this off, should it be on like a thicker, like nicer paper? Or? No. Yeah. That resume paper, you don't have to buy it anymore. Mm-hmm. Anything else? And most of the stuff you're going to be sending is going to be electronic like anyway. People are moving into the Thank you.